Hi, I'm Pastor Larry. I'm from Community Christian Fellowship. I'm one of a few pastors there. I've been there a long time. Um, I'm just happy to preach the the Bible, and and every chance I get, I just feel a little more enriched. I hope that you do too. You know, I I was ordained way back in the day, <laughs> longer than probably some of you have been alive. But I say that because there are certain truths that you might learn in Bible school or in seminary, and and then you, you you teach those things, and you teach the things you were taught, and of course you grow and you study regularly. Uh, but but then you go, gosh, there's more here than I ever realized, and and it's kind of like now as we're looking at the gospel as being all of the Bible, not just Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the, the gospel story and the gospel reality through the stories of humanity and people, that the principles of the gospel are throughout all of the scriptures, I'm just amazed when I just see it with clarity now, more more than I have in the past, more than I did those many years ago. And, and so as I'm looking at this idea of the gospel in all of the scriptures, and in particular, as we read the words of Jesus that said that he was telling them, that is, those he was walking with on the road to Emmaus and his disciples later, that he was talking to them after he had risen from the dead. He was explaining to them where he was or who he was in the books of Moses and the prophets. So that just has perked my my spiritual ears even more so towards that Old Testament reality of the gospel being there, Jesus being there, that all of the scriptures are pointing to him. So anyway, I've said enough of that, but I wanted to say that because when I look at the book of Exodus, we find there, again, this gospel narrative in the story of the enslavement of, of who were going to be the Hebrew people and and the freedom that they experienced through through the work of of God apart from their good works <laughs> apart from from them earning it and again that takes us back to this idea of the gospel of grace that the real gospel is God's freeing us from our fall from sin redeeming us but redeeming it redeeming us not based on our good works, but on his gracious hand. We find that reality in the book of Exodus because he's freeing the enslaved people in Egypt who will be the Hebrew people, not because of their good works, but because of the merciful and gracious hand of God. And then after that freedom, then another work entails. But I was thinking and looking at at those plagues of Exodus. And I want to read to you out of Exodus 6, 6 and 8, and then 10, 3 we'll read here just to get a sense of some things regarding this gospel or this freedom truth in the Old Testament. Therefore, say to the Israelites, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians, and I will free you from being slaves to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Now, if we pause there for a moment, this is real history, real, real time, real people, where God is, is speaking about deliverance. And he's going to deliver them from the yoke of slavery. So if we can take just a moment, Slavery is cruel. And the slavery that the Bible speaks about is, is the reality of a cruel taskmaster who regularly punishes those who are under the enslavement of the taskmaster. And that's how we are when we're under sin. We're under the cruel leadership of who we bow to when we're in sin because you see the slave must bow to his master we find that in egypt as those enslaved there 
were bowing down. They were required to bow down to the gods of the Egyptians. The cruel taskmaster of these gods that oversaw (laughs) false gods, demonic gods, they oversaw the leadership of Egypt. And so when we read here in Exodus, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. I will free you from being slaves to them. It's really a reflection of of God's deliverance of the man or the woman that comes to him through the redemption of Jesus and pulls us out of the slave market of sin and being under the enslavement to the evil one. That's true. It's just not a moral statement being said here. We find it in history, and God shows us in history as we read here through Exodus. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. Now, we can go on and on about the acts of Jesus and ultimately the judgment against the evil one. But let's move on here. I will take you as my own people, and I will be your God. See, God, Yahweh, is becoming the personal God of the Hebrew people. He's saying, I will be your God, and you will be my people. And we can read that in other places. And it's the reality of what happens when we come to know Jesus Christ. We become those who are now personally acquainted with him. We don't fully know him, but he knows us fully, and he's made me his. I I love the words that come here because they just, you know, reek, if I can say, maybe reek's not the right word because that has a negative connotation, but, but it's just saturated in intimacy. It's saturated in connection. It's saturated in relationship. This word means that that your mind means that we are related in a in a different way, in a close way. I will take you as my own people. That's what God does when we come to Christ. He takes us as his own. I'm no longer my own. I'm his. I taught this recently, and I don't mind saying it again, that, that when we're in the world, when we're not walking with Jesus, we're enslaved to the evil one. When we come to Christ, our freedom is enslavement to the true and mighty God, Yahweh. That we are enslaved to him, that we become his servants. So our freedom means that. We're free from the taskmaster of the old slave master, but we're now given to the gracious, merciful king of the universe. And we belong to him then it goes on to say that he'll take us, well, he's saying to the, to the Hebrew people, I will take you out of this enslavement that you have to the Egyptians. Now I'll bring you to a land that I swore uh, with uplifted hand to give to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. It's kind of the statement, this will happen because I'm the Lord. <laughs> I love it. This is going to happen. Why? Because I'm the Lord. Because I say so. Because it's who he is. And so we come to Christ and we have a new destiny. Our destiny is heaven. Why? Because he says so. Because he's the Lord. Well, I don't want to just, again, try to, you know, just see all this as some kind of moral. This is real history where real people are enslaved. But it's part of the story of the recurring story of God's redeeming work in humanity and ultimately the ultimate redemption that comes in Jesus. In Exodus 10, 3, it says this, So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, This is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go. I love that again. Let whose people go? God says, my people go. We belong to him. They belong to him. And let me go back just a moment. It wasn't because they earned it. They weren't these lovely, in fact, we're going to find they're stiff-necked, stubborn, fallen people who had a mindset 
to be enslaved. They are a grumbling people. They will be a people who will be in the desert for 40 years because they're grumblers and stiff-necked and stubborn. He saves those people. Can you relate to that? <laughs> I think we can. Well, I, maybe I just speak for myself. This is what the Lord, it says in 10.3 of Exodus, this is what the Lord, the God of Hebrews says, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go so they may worship me. Why is he asking for their freedom? That they might become true worshipers of Yahweh. You know, I don't think I, I wrote it down, but there was words of a of a particular rabbi who spoke of this passage and the freedom from the enslavement to the the Egyptians through the plagues as God's judgment on those who afflict his people and and a lesson to all those who'd want to inflict enslavement or judgment on his people that this will happen to you and i thought he kind of missed the point cuz he never brought out the responsibility of those who are being freed but with clarity the bible tells us that they're being freed to be somebody they're being freed to be worshipers in fact jesus comes on the scene to say to be true worshipers cuz we worship from the heart this true god so if you refuse to let them go i will bring locusts into your country tomorrow that's how important <laughs> their freedom was but again their freedom was freedom to worship the god of the universe so it's important we understand this this old testament sense of of worship because it carries on into the New Testament, in fact, the New Testament sense of worship is only a reflection and a fulfillment of the Old Testament sense of worship. I've said it many times in our church because uh, I, uh, I've been involved with worship from the, from the side of worship and song. But we often say, let's have worship, and we mean let's sing, let's praise, let's do music together. But worship is much bigger than that. In fact, when we worship in song, we're hopefully helping people make, we're trying to make it easier for people to bring their hearts and their minds and their attitudes in a surrendering place before God. So that song, worship in song is part of that. But it really is about bringing our whole selves into the presence of God in surrender to who he is. So when we hear the word worship, we often just think of the worship in song part. But worship is actually grateful submission of my whole life to this God who's intimate with me, who loves me. It's worship in the sense that I bow down in service to God. Literal service, that my life is in service to this God. And worship is the reverence or the respect or the awe of this God. See, worship is all of that. And bringing my heart and my mind to that place. And you see in the Old Testament, the sacrificial system was given to Israel to enable, again, the cleansing from sin, the consecration to God, or the right of the setting, the being set apart for God. It's the expression of gratitude to God. And that's all that what happens to the person who comes to Christ. We come and we're cleansed from our sin. We come and we're set apart for service to God. And then we express that in, our, in the gratitude of our lives. We're called to have an attitude of gratitude. The Bible tells us to be thankful in all things. See, that's the gospel. We're just not freed from the slavery of the old taskmaster. But we're freed be under 
the new leadership, the new king, the king of glory, the merciful king. Now, we can read all over the Bible, especially as we look at it backwards from the New Testament, that the Bible tells us in response to what God has done for us in Christ, we are to present our bodies to him as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, it tells us in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. That our whole bodies, it it doesn't mean just the flesh. It means all of us, the entirety of me, that I'm to bring my whole life in response to this God who loves me and who, has remember, has, has called me his own. That's the gospel. That's what we read in the book of Exodus as it's all, remember, pointing to Jesus. Remember that? Let's not forget that these things that we're reading about, especially in the first five books of the, of the Bible, the Pentateuch, the books of Moses, the book of Exodus here as being the second one in those five, that is pointing to Jesus when it talks about these things regarding the enslavement of the Egyptians and their freedom. We're freed to worship. Now, I hope that that brings a kind of reality to what life is about. That our purpose in life is learning to submit to God in every part of our lives. That we might respond to life and all that we do and say as a response to God who has freed us so that we work and play and learn and commune with our neighbors as those who are worshiping this God. It changes all of our lives, what we do and why we do it. We are purposeful, mindful human beings when we come to Jesus, to worship him in our submission, in our service, in our awe and our reverence to God, because that's what it means to be freed, to worship him with our whole selves. And the book of Exodus is again exclaiming that as it gives us the story of the Hebrews that are freed from their enslavement to the Egyptians. The service rendered to God in everyday obedience is the focus of why God is asking, essentially telling the Pharaoh to release his people, that they might come and learn that. And how hard has that been? (laughs) Think of all the years and all the scriptures of a hard-headed, stiff-necked is the term used in the scriptures, of a people who find that difficult to do. And isn't it true about us too? What it means to surrender to God in every way, in every aspect of our lives. That we might speak things in ways that are edifying, building up of others we don't tear others down, that we forgive quickly, that we find joy in the midst of our suffering and trials because we're not without that, but that we have attitudes that reflect that we know where we're going, where we've come from, that we're reflecting the reality of God's movement in our lives to save us, to keep us saved, and to give us a destiny. I frankly, sometimes I find that that's very hard for us to do as believers, and the, and the Spirit is inside of us, leading us, guiding us, teaching us, comforting us, the Bible tells us, in the person of the Holy Spirit. We're to offer up a sacrifice of praise, that that would be the fruit of our lips as we profess the name of Jesus. It tells us that in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. May we learn to be those who have been taken out of the slave environment of an evil taskmaster and brought into the company, the intimate company of a God who loves us and has freed us to worship with all that I've already said in the fullness of who we are as human beings. Well, I hope that the reality of this truth in Exodus, the gospel there, helps you live a more freeing life an up life, not a down life. 
a life that is filled with hope because we believe these truths to be ours by the very grace of God that came through Jesus the Son. May you know this salvation and work it out in your life. Well, God bless you. I hope to see you this Sunday at CCF if you don't go to a church already. We start at 1030. I think the address and all those kinds of things are there in our website. Hope that you visit us there and you know, put a thumbs up or what have you. But I hope that this ministers to you. And if it does, let us know. Well, God bless you. Have a good rest of the day or evening and go in peace. Walk among your love